All right, you have some new notes. We're going to start a brand new series this morning, and uh, that so- series begins. We're going to talk about the 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk about those disciples. Mark chapter 3 and verse number 14, and your Bible says, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach. So he ordained 12 that should be with him and that he would send them forth to preach. So we're talking about the 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, these were the men that were chosen of Christ and they would, they would be the ones who would direct the foundation of the New Testament church. I'm going to start with a few things to help in, by way of explanation. Notice in the first paragraph in the Gospel of Mark. Now, the Gospel of Mark is a book of action. When you open the book of Mark, it's not like Matthew. Matthew opens up and he gives you genealogies and he gives you the story of Christ. He tells you about the birth and the angels and the, and the wise men. And goes into, Luke goes into a lot of detail on all of those things. Now, those are the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then you have one gospel that is unique. That's the gospel of John. Now, John's gospel really is all about the deity of Christ. It's really about presenting Jesus Christ in the fullness of his Godhead. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. It's, it's a, one of the gospels, but yet it is uniquely different in many aspects. Mark is unique because he's writing to a particular audience. His audience are Roman citizens. He's writing to people in a very common sense and explaining things very very, very quickly. He's, he just starts out with a story. I, I mean, it's almost to me, Mark is writing from the perspective as God wanted him to present it as if he was a, a reporter on the ground on the scene. Tuning in right now, is a, and, and, and here he goes. He just starts out, and he starts telling us all of the adventures of the Lord Jesus. In, in the first four chapters, you're, you can't believe how much ground you cover because Mark is writing a gospel, if we could, a book of action. It's written particularly to the Roman citizen presenting Christ as a suffering servant. But we're told in chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 15, this statement, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Here's John the Baptist Here is that spirit of Elijah. Here is that one coming forth, proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. So it begins here really with a fulfillment of the prophecy concerning the coming of Christ into the world. First, number one, his birth. His birth. What an amazing story is told of the birth of Christ. It is such detail. It's so, it's so, most of us can't even remember the details of our own birth. Of course, I can't remember mine at all, but five children, I can remember some. Uh, my wife can probably remember everything, but, uh, but the story of the birth of Christ is so marvelous because it is all documented in the Word of God. Then notice, secondly, his baptism. His baptism, another significant event in the life and ministry of Christ. And this is, of course, he was baptized by God's appointed messenger. And would you just highlight right there, underline that appointment Uh, This was a divine appointment, and this was God's messenger, all right? It was by God's appointment, and it was a messenger. This was John the Baptist, and he was one, and you might even just write this over there in the margin. He was sent. He was sent by God, all right? So we're going to see these terms all come to play in just a moment. And it culminates, if you will, with the beginning, number three, with the beginning of his personal ministry. And you can see that developed all the way through chapter number one and following. Now, Jesus begins his ministry by calling the first of 12 men who he will ordain to go forth and preach the gospel, as we just read from Mark 3 and verse 14. In John chapter 1 and verse 35 through verse 36, we discover that two of Jesus' disciples were already waiting by the sea when Jesus comes walking towards them. If you take your Bibles to John chapter number 1, and we'll go over to verse number 35. I'll find our place here, if you, and, and we'll start. I'm going to start in verse number 28, because your Bible says that <coughs> these things were done in Beth, Bethabara, uh, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, notice what it says. We have the indication of the time frame. The next day, this was after the day of baptism, John seeth Jesus coming 
unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not. But that he was man in Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So he's testifying that by prophecy he was told that when Jesus came, when the Messiah came, he would baptize with the Spirit. And then he made this statement, and you'll know him because he's the one that when he is baptized, the dove will descend from heaven and will proclaim him to be the Son of God. So here's John going, okay, I'm going to baptize this guy, and I'm pretty sure that this is him, but I don't know for sure. And he baptizes him in the water. He comes up out of the water in a voice from heaven, and the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You see the Trinity in action right there. You see the Father, you hear the Father's voice. You see the Spirit descending upon the Son of God, and all three together in one time. Wow, what a manifold witness of, the, of, of God's prophecy. And so the next day following, he says in verse number 35, Now the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Now he's saying it with boldness. He's saying it with authority because God has given him a divine sanction and a sign that gave him assurance that this is the very Christ. And this will become the message that John is preaching. Now notice those two disciples. They were fo- and two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? Now he'll go into detail. In just a few more verses, you'll find two more disciples are going to be added. So let's go back to our notes, if you would. As he begins his ministry, the first two chosen were, number four, Andrew. Andrew, who found his brother, number five, Simon Peter. And Simon Peter brought him to see the Christ. It's so exciting when you're reading this. And and, 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 and Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, He findeth his own, verse 41, his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, look what he says, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Amen? Andrew's the first soul winner mentioned in the New Testament. He went out and found his brother and brought him to Jesus. Amen? The only sermon I heard John R. Rice preach was a brother ought to win a brother. A brother ought to win a brother. (laughs) So the second two were Philip, number six, and Nathaniel. So Andrew found Simon Peter, and they went, and and Jesus came by and found Philip and Nathaniel. And these men had been following John the Baptist's doctrine. And as followers, you might circle the word followers. You see, this is very important. We'll talk about this in just a minute. The word follow is critical because the first thing Jesus says to these men, follow me. By the way, the last thing Jesus will say to them is, follow me. Do you know what Jesus told you to do? Follow me. Matter of fact, he even left us an example so we could follow his steps, 1 Peter 2.21. We'll get there in just a moment. Hang on. All right. These men have been following Jesus, or following John, and notice number eight. They were called disciples. The Greek word discipulos, and what it means is they are students. They they are learners, and that's where we get the word followers. They were following Christ. now, Now, they had been following John, but now they're going to follow Christ. And at this point, 
they were the disciples of John, but now they're going to be disciples of Christ because they're no longer following John. They're no longer following John's doctrine and John's distinctives, but they are now following the doctrines or teachings of Christ. So they're following him. And so the term that is used is disciple. Now, if you're in discipleship, I, I think I saw the, the list the Oaks gave me, 26 names in discipleship right now, people being discipled within the context of the church. If you're in discipleship, you're either a discipler or a disciple. Now, if you need to be discipled, you said, I've never been discipled. I don't really know how to disciple someone else, but I'd like to. I encourage you, get in the Daily in the Word Discipleship Program because it not only disciples you, but it disciples you to disciple others. So you're either a disciple or a discipler. If you're not discipling someone else, then you're still a disciple or you're backslid. All right, nobody wants to be backslid. So, all right, so disciple means student. It means a learner. It means a follower. In discipleship, we will give you seven steps of discipleship. And, 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 and what the Bible says a disciple is. I say, is there eight, I think. Maybe there's eight. I can't count. I'm dyslexic. But, um, but, but, but it starts out, really, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must be, believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and be born again. You can't be a disciple if you're not first a believer. So that's the first requirement of being a disciple. So I want you to see this is very important as we begin our study that when Jesus calls these men, he is calling them first to salvation. He is calling them to believe him and to obey him and to follow him. And because they do, they are called disciples. Okay? They are now following his doctrine. They are now following his truth. They are now his students. That's why they call him Rabboni. That's why they call him Master, uh, being a teacher. The masters of the, among the Jews were teachers. Uh, lawyers uh, were not like lawyers today. Uh, you know, they don't even practice law today. But, 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 but a master was a teacher. And so Jesus would teach his disciples. So disciples are learners. Now the question is, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? Who are you a disciple of? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Then that would mean that you are first a believer. So you believe the message of Jesus Christ, and now you are beginning to learn from him. And so that's what a believer does. We are discipled in Christ, all right? So they were number nine, they were called to follow. Disciples were followers of Christ. He called them. They followed John's gospel. Now the title is primarily referring to followers of Christ. Number 10, followers of Christ. Now in a general sense, but even more specifically, there are a select few who would have a higher calling and purpose. And that's number 11, the 12. The 12, these 12, as they were called, were disciples. Number 12. So let me, let me back up. Because when Jesus came passing by, they saw him. They turned their attention to him, much like Moses turned his eyes on the burning bush. They turned their eyes to Christ, and he spoke to them. And then they, he said, follow me. And they put down their fishing nets, and they followed him. They put, a, put, a, put aside John's doctrine. They put aside all of that, and they began to follow Jesus. When they chose to follow him, they were answering, very important, his call. He called them, just like we talked in the last few weeks about the call of God upon the, the life of every individual. So the first call is the call of salvation. Then these followers were called disciples. Now I'm saying all that because I want to lay a foundation for us to build upon in the next several weeks. And one of the things we have to understand is what is a disciple of Jesus Christ? Because apparently today it doesn't really have a lot of significance. But what it meant was literally followers of Christ. And so when you read your New Testament over and over and over again, and the Apostle Paul in the epistles certainly gives us much evidence of this, we are instructed in how to follow Christ, how we're to follow him. We are to be his disciples. 
Now, we are not only to follow him, but we're going to see and discover with these men here that there's another calling that goes even higher than that, and that is what God chooses for us. So he calls us to salvation. He calls these men to salvation, and he says they are his disciples because they were, uh, number 12, they were disciples. Number 13, they were followers. Because they were followers, they were called disciples. Everybody got that? We can move on. The first words of Jesus to Peter and John were simply, follow me. The words are repeated often, and as they were in the last words of John chapter 21, when Jesus is speaking to both Peter and John, and you remember what he says to them? He says, follow me. And and Peter turneth about and seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. And so that was the last words that Christ had with his disciples before he was getting ready to depart and go uh, to the Father. So the instruction is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to be a follower of his teachings. Okay? We're all on, on the same page with that. In the New Testament, the Greek word for disciple is used 261 times. It appears only in the Gospels and the book of Acts. 72 times, it is a direct reference to the apostles, the apostles. And then there are John the Baptist's disciples, number 16. And then there were the Pharisees' disciples in Matthew 22 and verse number 16. And, and, and there are direct references also given of the 12. They're called the 12. Now, the Gospel of Mark uses disciples 46 times and Luke 37 times. And in John's Gospel, 78 times it is used interchangeably for either the disciples of others or the disciples of Christ or referring to the 11 or the 12 or the apostles. Now, notice in the book of Acts, the 12 are never mentioned by that title. Instead, they are called, you ready for this, number 20, the apostles. All right? So here's what we have. There were 12 disciples. They were men who had been called. Anyone who is called, who follows Jesus called to salvation, follows Jesus, believe the message of the gospel, they are called disciples. We are his disciples because we were called to salvation and because we believe his doctrine and we are following Christ. We are his disciples. Out of those disciples in those days, God chose 12. 12 selected men were chosen of God, and they were called apostles. First, disciples, because they followed. But now their title is changed because there's something distinct about the twelve. Okay? And so they are called apostles. Let's look at that final paragraph at the bottom of the page. The distinct title that identifies the twelve is apostle. This word has the meaning of selected. Selected. That means he chose them out. You know, God's call of salvation is to anyone. You hear me, class? It's to anyone. It's not to everyone. Because anyone who will believe can receive. But not everyone will believe. But anyone who will can be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But there are multitudes of people, even though the blood of Christ will more than adequately cover their sin, they will not believe. And Jesus said, except ye believe that I am he, ye die in your sin. And if you die in your sin, whither I go, ye cannot come. So not everyone is going to be saved, though anyone could be saved. But these men answered not only that call to salvation, but then they were chosen These disciples were chosen to be apostles, all right? So we all began the same way. We began by believing, we began by receiving, 
we began by answering the call of salvation, and we became disciples when we followed Jesus. Now, there are many people who profess to be Christians today who never follow Jesus. They don't read the Bible. They don't pray. They don't go to church. They don't serve the Lord. Uh, they don't witness for Christ. They don't give to the things of God. They don't live a clean and pure and holy life, and yet they still claim to be born again. They still claim to be Christian. They have all kinds of titles they use and things that they talk about. And they all say they're going to heaven because they, they think they're good enough or they've done some. How people who think they're good enough, who do so little, can even imagine that? And it just strikes me as unusual. I'm doing everything I can, and I'm not even trying to earn my way to heaven. But I'm thinking sometimes it would be a good thing. You talk about a fundraiser in a Baptist church. If salvation were suddenly by works, no, it won't work. Down at the bottom of the page, number, number 23, selected. That means, I love the word selected because it was on purpose. He selected them. He chose 12, the 12. Not only that, but number 24, they were set apart. Very important, they were set apart. Okay? They're no longer just disciples, though they'll still be referred to on occasion as disciples. There will be times they're referred to because, because of the, and, and if you'll go back and look at the context, because they were following, the word is used quite often. The translators have it right because these were men who followed Jesus. All right? But I want you to see most of all uh, that specifically, number 25, be sent. To be sent. Now, here's what I want you to get. Not just as followers, which you and I would say followers, disciples, but specially and specifically, they were appointed sent ones. Numbers 26. These 12 are unique over all other disciples. Not only did they answer God's call, but they were chosen of God. They were selected. They were set apart. And then they were sent. God is going to send them. That means he's going to give the 12 a unique assignment, different than all other disciples. Now, you have to see this because we're living in a generation today where everybody's playing with words and, and meanings of words and changing things. Marriage no longer means marriage, and, 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 and man doesn't mean man and woman. And it's just so we're living in such a confused generation of people. But the Bible said what it meant and meant what it said. So these men are unique. They are, there are something special about them. God selected them on purpose, and he chose them to be sent by him. Hence the word apostle. Notice, if you will, they first answered God's call to salvation, number 27. They were saved, and they followed Jesus. So what's number 28, class? His disciples. And then they answered God's call to serve, number 29. So he has appointed them to serve him. Now we talked about those seven calls, and the first call being the call of salvation. Then, of course, the call of submission. These, these men had to submit to the will of God for their lives, and they did. There had to be a call of separation, and there was. They came out from among them, and so forth and so on as we answer those seven calls. But I want you to notice that last statement. is Jesus divinely appointed number 30 apostles. Apostles. Maybe right there in the margin of your notes or at the bottom of the page, it'd simply say this. Number one, they were called to salvation. They were called to salvation. That's so critical to understand. Number two, they were chosen to serve. They were chosen to serve. And number three, they were commissioned to be sent. They were commissioned to be sent, to preach the gospel to the whole world, to take the gospel out. Now, we know that one among them, we'll discover, is a deceiver. One pretended to be saved. Now, you have to understand, at the time when Jesus made the announcement at his Lord's memorial table, when he made the announcement that one of you shall betray me, the 12 of them didn't go, yeah, Judas. That's not what happened. They all said, Lord, is it I? There was no evidence that Judas had lived in such a manner as anything other than the apostles. They, they did miracles. They did signs. They did wonders. Literally, he carried the money bag. He was the treasurer. 
I mean, they all thought he was one of them. So is it possible that when God gives a call, some will say they answer the call, even appear to have answered a call, and yet in the end, our Lord Jesus said, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Is that possible? It is absolutely possible, and that's why salvation cannot be based upon our performance. It must be based upon the person of Jesus Christ and the payment that he alone made. Either his blood is applied to our account, or we are still in full debt. So these were men that answered the call, chose to serve, and were commissioned to be sent. Now, now notice the last statement. These 12 would be spiritual leaders, not simply followers. They would become the most significant part of God's plan to preach the gospel to the rest of the world. Now, top of page number two, I believe, is like the title disciple, number 31, the word apostle also has dual application. First, there is a general application, which identifies all those who are followers of Christ. And our Lord is emphasize, emphasizes this throughout the New Testament. And he even leaves us an example. But secondly, there is a direct application of a distinct individual office. Sometimes the term apostle, because it means sent one, because that's what the meaning is, it is used to speak of others who were sent. You have to read the context, you have to examine it to see when it uses the word apostle, is it talking about one of the twelve? Or is it talking about someone else? Is it just simply saying sent? Uh, when you get to the book of Revelation, it talks about the stars and it talks about them, and it uses the word angelos. The word angelos means literally angel. The angels of the Lord were called angelos because they were sent. They were messengers. Do you remember? You have Michael, uh, My, My, Michael, and you have and and you have Gabriel. Gabriel was the announcing angel, and Michael was the avenging angel. And, of course, there was Lucifer who fell, and, and uh, that's another story. But, but sometimes in the Bible, preachers are referred to in the same sense as angelos. Not that we're angels, though we're always harping about something. But, but literally, it's the idea of one who is sent, a messenger. You and I have been sent by God. We are his not apostle, we are his ambassadors, okay? But the word apostle carries the same connotation as ambassador. So these men were sent by God, and they were sent on purpose. So here's those words. We want to be careful when we're reading our Bible that we don't get confused because false doctrine comes when confusion comes in, and God is not the author of confusion, so we know what a disciple is, and we now know when it says the apostles, we're talking about the 12. We're talking about 12 men chosen of God at that time to represent him to be his sent ones. Now, are there other apostles? Are there other sent ones? Are there other ambassadors? Are there other messengers? Are there other missionaries? Yes, but they are not the 12. They are not the apostles. They were not selected for that appointment, okay? Notice, if you will, number 34, the 12 apostles were called to salvation first, and as believers, they began to follow Jesus, and from his disciples, number 35, our Lord chose the 12. You say you're saying that over and over again. I learned from an attorney who told me recently the reason that attorneys win so many cases is because they repeat themselves. When a matter is urgent, they repeat it, they emphasize it. They were saying the reason that many pastors are successful in ministry is because they repeat themselves. One man was visiting our church one time. He said, you repeat yourself too much. And I said, well, if you'd learn it the first time, I wouldn't. Number 36, the 12, to ordain or to appoint 
to be, here's number 37, his sent ones. We've got to make sure we have this down. We use titles such as ambassador, messenger, missionary. These were those who were appointed, number 38. They were appointed, they were selected, they were chosen, they were given a distinct purpose. Our Lord would send these 12 apostles, number 39, these 12 apostles as his ambassadors. So he gave them a special office to which he ordained them. In other words, he put them in a special place, a special designation, a special uh, position that they held that was not held by all the disciples. It was not held by others who were sent, by other missionaries, uh, by other ministries or ambassadors. These 12 had a unique distinction and, and, as, as apostles. The 12 apostles who form the foundation of the church and the Lord Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, Acts chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter number 2. So these men are unique. Their names are literally etched in the, in the walls in heaven. Does that give us an idea about the significance of these individuals? Now, I know some of you, if your brains are going really quick, like Brother Smith down here is already thinking, okay, so if Judas wasn't, written whose name was. Stay tuned next week. <laughs> All right? So the names are written down as the foundation of the church. So this specific office designated the apostles. It's only given to the 12. And clearly there is seen various contexts. Beyond the direct application, there were others referred to as an apostle in a generic sense. Number 44, Barnabas, is called an apostle in the book of Acts. Adronicus and Junius, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 7, they were also men who were sent. They had a distinction, okay? Uh, uh, it, it, was, it was their duty. It was not a designation. The 12 had a designation. They had a, a distinct office. But these apostles... It just refers to their duty as being sent with a message, and they were those who were sent. The same word is used in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 23 concerning Titus. And again in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25 of Aphrodite. Aphrodite was called a, a, as an apostle. So here the emphasis on those has to do with being sent rather than a specific office or designation. Matter of fact, even Jesus is called an apostle in Hebrews 3.1 as one who is sent, that he was the Christ, the anointed, the one sent from the Father. So he was, a, he was a, as an apostle, but not the apostles, not the twelve. So some things we should know, and I just in this little box right here, the designation of apostle to the twelve has specific requirements. Number one, they had to be a witness of the resurrected Christ. Literally, they had to be familiar with the walk and the work and the witness of Jesus Christ. They had to have seen the miracles. They had to have heard his ministry. They had to have been impacted and influenced by the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in particular, they had to have seen the risen Christ. Number two, to have been so selected by the Holy Spirit of God specifically. In other words, not everyone was chosen. All are called. Do all respond? No. No. Not everyone will be saved, but anyone can be saved. But anyone means those who answer God's call. You believe, you receive. But then there's a, 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 a choosing. God chose these 12 among all the disciples. Remember, all of the believers were called disciples. But out of all of those believers, God chose 12 distinct individuals. All right? And the Holy Spirit of God evidences God's choice. And we'll see that as we develop through this. Number three, they had to have been given special abilities to perform signs and wonders. So these 12 apostles, because they were sent, God gave them special anointing upon their ministries. 
Now, we know that at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit will come down and fill the body of believers. But prior to that, these apostles manifested gifts of the Holy Spirit as Jesus gave them the Spirit. These men were able to do signs and wonders and miracles. It manifests their witness and testimony, gave them authority and credibility. Not every disciple is an apostle. Not every disciple can work those wonders and those miracles. Every disciple can be a spirit-filled believer. But at this time, the Spirit of God came upon them, evidencing a unique selection. Okay, you can't emphasize this enough. There's a lot of confusion in the world today because people divert from what is biblically true in Scripture. Okay, number four, to lay the foundation of the church following their faithful example. In other words, literally, these men were chosen to be living examples, even as Jesus said when he was leaving that they would be his witnesses. We would be, you would be witnesses of me, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. These men would keep the ministry of Christ going forward. Their primary function, twofold, lay the foundation of the church and preach the gospel and reach the world. That was their goal. That was their ministry. And that's what they accomplished. Now, what these men do is they, they literally... Lay that foundation. By the bottom of the page, you'll notice a little note I put at the bottom of the page for you. And that is simply this, that these men laid the foundation of the church. 2,000 years later, we are not laying the foundation of the church. Okay, They accomplished the ministry God sent them to do in their lifetime. They laid the foundation upon which we build our church today. Jesus said, this is my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so the church of Jesus Christ is not in its foundational uh, uh, state. That was accomplished by these 12 apostles. We are not still trying to accomplish the laying of the foundation that has been accomplished. If you'll notice on the next page, you'll see four lists of the apostles there. And you can see them and compare them. I want you to be able to compare them together uh, so that you can see. Notice that the note at the bottom of the page among the 12 was Jesus' inner circle. Three in particular were closer than the others. Number 50 was Peter. 51 is James. And of course, most notable is John, 52, who is called the disciple whom Jesus loved in five different occasions in the Gospel of John. These three saw miracles and had intimate moments with the master the other disciples were not privy to, including the time that Jesus raised the girl from the dead and he put everyone out of the room but these three, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and then at the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus prayed that high priestly prayer. However, they slept most of the way through it. The biggest difference between the lists is that Luke lists one disciple as Judas, son of James, sometimes called Jude, while Mark and Matthew list one as Thaddeus, most commonly assumed to be one and the same. It's interesting to me that in the Gospel of John never lists all 12 of the disciples. Several names on the list are never mentioned in John, but John does, however, mention an apostle, Nathaniel. And Nathaniel is closely related to Philip. And since Bartholomew is closely associated with Philip, but never mentioned in John, this is why most people assume they are one and the same individual. He closed by saying, the last page, before Jesus called these men to salvation, before he confessed them as his disciples and chose them to be his sent ones, he spent all night in prayer. And it came to pass in those days that as he went out of the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God, and when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he also he named apostles. All were ordained with a purpose. All would die as martyrs for that purpose. One is a traitor who would die in his sin, and 11 who would lay the foundation of the church and live and die by faith. John would pin five books of the New Testament, James the less one, Peter two, 
Judas, not Iscariot, Jude, and Matthew, the book of the same name. Nine of the 27 books of the New Testament were written by the apostles, by the 12, all right? And in particular, the Gospels. All right, we got through our study this morning. Praise the Lord right on time. Amen. All right, Uh, we'll dismiss you. The restrooms and drinking fountains are in the foyer. Avail yourself to those. And uh, I would encourage you, this next week, they're going to have these binders available out in the foyer. If you want to buy one of these binders, uh, there'll be a couple of dollars, I'm sure. They're not free. The, the pages are free, though they are costing us. But, but I hope you'll ke- keep them and collect them. And we're going to go through this entire series talking about the 12. All right, God bless you. You're at liberty to go.